in our last joint seminar with Oxford University. But so we've been doing this seminar series from between SARS and Oxford for about the past year now. Um, and this particular one um, is the last in the series and we're wanting to uh, really look at considering how we can try to be better partners and actually look at some of the practical perspectives of working in international research. Um, so as I said, I've been working at SOAS uh, for about six years and have been responsible really mainly for the sort of research development, pre-award side of things, looking at research ethics, contracts and due diligence. Um, um, and just a few other little sort of housekeeping matters. Um, I also need to sort of let you know that you've all currently been muted. Um, and I'll, if you could please remain muted throughout the uh, sort of presentation bit of the, of the seminar. Um, that would be uh, fantastic. But, you know, obviously at the end of the presentation, if you do have any comments um, or questions, please do let me know through the chat function and I will ask you to unmute yourself and then speak and ask your question or your suggestion or view, whatever it, it may be that you'd like to contribute to the discussion. Um, if you don't have, uh, if you don't want to obviously um, ask the question yourself, feel free to type something in the chat box and I can read that question out to our panel members as well. Um, if you happen to have any thoughts at the end of the seminar that you'd like to share or things come to mind, we do have a sort of email uh, group list, uh, which is decolonialhe at discmail.ac.uk. Um, I think Ramin is going to maybe type that in the chat box as well. Um, people can subscribe to that list and we're hoping to sort of try and carry on this conversation um, through that uh, email group as well. So. This is, as I say, our last sort of seminar in the series, and we wanted to really briefly reflect on the series so far um, and consider whether or not we've actually achieved some of the main objectives um, uh, through this sort of uh, seminar series looking at research for development. Um, we also wanted to look more closely at sort of, you know, the practical steps about how we can try to be better partners in international research. And then at the end, what we're really hoping for is a more interactive discussion. So please don't be afraid to kind of come forward and share your viewpoints and what you've been doing at your institutions um, and, and your own personal experiences. Um, so what I'm also going to do today is I'm going to introduce sort of all of our speakers now, give you their biography so that when we actually start the presentations, it can sort of hopefully flow a bit more seamlessly, technology allowing. Um, and so just to begin, I you know to, to first of all say that I'm delighted to say that we are joined today by two excellent anthropologists um, with extensive experience of working internationally and building strong and enduring partnerships through research collaboration. Um, we have Emma Crew, who is a research professor at SOAS University of London. Um, she also teaches, though I should say, uh, postgraduates at the University of Hertfordshire's Business School and is director of the Global Research Network on Parliaments and People, um, which is an AHRC GCRF funded project. Um, and the network focuses on researching the relationship between parliaments and people and is currently focusing on Ethiopia and Myanmar, um, but its scope is soon to expand through funding from the European Research Council to also include Brazil, Ethiopia, Fiji, India, the UK and the US. And I know I'm certainly going to be very interested to find the, you know, to, to, to look at the findings from that research project over the coming years. Um, in addition to Emma, we will also be joined by Professor Joe Boyden. Although she is now retired, she is a social anthropologist and has been the former director of the project Young Lives, uh, which is a comparative longitudinal study of childhood poverty, which has been based at the, uh, at the University of Oxford. Young Lives is managed through a partnership structure involving 11 study country organisations, as well as research collaborators at various universities in the UK and the USA. Joe's research has centred on children's education and work, as well as young people's experiences of and responses to poverty, armed conflict and forced migration. Um, prior to joining Young Lives, uh, Joe worked with diverse stakeholders from governments, INGOs, CSOs, research institutes, uh, communities and sort of a vast array of young people in generating research evidence for use in designing policies and programmes for young people living in situations of adversity. So very much looking forward to hearing both Emma and jo Joe's experience of working um, sort of in international research. So as well as the academic research perspective, part of this series has really been trying to join together the researchers, the research administrators, and also the funders' viewpoints and trying to sort of navigate these tensions as we might perceive them. And so today we're also going to be um, hearing from um, uh, the co-creators of the series, Romina Estrati, who is the GCRF officer at Soros University and also a research fellow, and Maru Mormina from Oxford University, who is a senior researcher and ethics advisor at the University of Oxford. 
Um, in addition, we're also fortunately uh, to be joined by Emily Graham as well, who is the ODA Due Diligence Manager at Oxford University. She has over eight years experience of working in research management and has uh, helped to design, develop and implement the due diligence process for Oxford. In addition to this, she also manages the GCRF QR budget from Research England and has co-created the ODA Community of Practice at the uh, University of Oxford and Emily and I are both members of the ELMA International Working Group for MPRO and so we're both sort of um, also uh, working together there to look at supporting research management with um, between UK and African universities as well. Um, so lots of kind of um, uh, areas of overlap in fact between what you've been doing and what we've been doing at SOAS there as well. So really looking forward to hearing how you introduce due diligence, um, uh, your experiences of due diligence at Oxford. Um, so before we sort of hear from everybody on a sort of one-to-one -one basis as such though, I'm going to sort of shortly ask my kind of co-creators of the series to share some of their key reflections of the series so far. Um, and, you know, just to say very briefly, we started this series wanting to challenge that the status quo of how international collaborative research was funded, how it was supported and how it was conducted. Um, and, you know, to sort of create a safe space, if you like, for researchers, research administrators and funders to discuss the challenges that we're all facing. And I think just very briefly before I hand over to Romina, just, you know, some of the key points that I've learned throughout this series and through working at SOAS in particular has been the importance to listen to our partners and actually to hear and understand what, you know, people are experiencing in, in the places that they're working and then try to, to reflect upon that and consider how our own institutional policies and procedures, you know, affect perhaps some of those relationships and the development of, of projects um, at the universities. I think through the series, we've tried to raise some of the key issues that have come up over the over the last few years, particularly around safeguarding and ethics and sort of gender equality, um, sort of publishing issues. We did think want to do one on impact and stuff like that, but you know, with COVID and everything, a few of our sessions got cancelled. But I think the important thing for me personally is that kind of reflection and to actually ask the questions has been really important. And as part of our, our sort of project at SOAS with the QRGCRF strategy, we did undertake an internal review where we were asking our academic colleagues and other professional services outside of research and enterprise um, what their experiences were of doing undertaking international research. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to hand over to my colleague uh, Romina who's going to share her reflections and also some of the findings from our internal report. So Romina, I hand over to you. Lovely, thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Can you see the slides? Yes? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, lovely. So I have very little time. <laughs> I'm very conscious of that. And I thought instead of giving some sort of cumulative reflections, I could just uh, speak about the key insights from the internal review uh, and, and, you know, highlighting some of the sort of common themes that emerged also in the series so far. Um, so this, this review, which was actually a research project, uh, it, it was aimed at uh, facilitating the implementation of SOAS's GCRF strategy. We received QR funds, obviously, uh, to meet those objectives. And we wanted to investigate more systematically what the barriers are in terms of our research development processes uh, and how we build partnerships, but also the good practices that our, our academics follow and how we might you know, uh, improve these or, or leverage on those. Um, it included holding semi-structured interviews with SOA staff, uh, professional services and uh, academics, PIs and project staff. Uh, about 27 uh, interviews were conducted uh, between uh, you know, the, the months of May and July 2020. Um, so the, the main, the first uh, sort of um, insight that I'd like to talk about uh, regards the research development process in, relations to, in relation to research context and LMIC uh, capacity. Um, one of the key themes that emerged was that, again, research environments differ. And so, uh, it, you know, it's important to understand that different organizations and different partner uh, institutions uh, will have different levels of capacity uh, or experience with research development and grant management, especially international grant management. Um, and it also depends on the, on the career level and the experience of the specific researcher or, or academic um, uh, that is a, par a partner to a project. Uh, the other important insight was that, again, institutional processes in partner organizations differ. Um, so they can be as bureaucratic or time consuming as they often are in UK HIEs. Uh, approval processes sometimes, uh, you know, uh, need to be made by high-ranking uh, individuals who need to be chased uh, and, and so forth. Um, and it was also uh, quite uh, emphasized that, you know, uh, local partner teams often are implicated in hierarchies and power dynamics. So it's important to understand that this will then influence partner engagement and their responsiveness to the project. I won't read through everything. Um, 
but I, I'll highlight the, the most important points. You can read the slides later, uh, you know, more slowly. Um, other, another set of key insights related to PIs and how PIs uh, sort of um, collaborate with their partners. Uh, it emerged that, you know, oftentimes PIs tend to favor partners that, you know, as one would expect, that are reliable and responsive. Uh, but this should also be assessed in uh, combination with the, with, the, with the comment that oftentimes research partners for, from elite and Western or the Westernized class are favored in this project. So some PIs spoke about big names being favored over lower ranking staff and so forth. Uh, the other important insight in terms of uh, PI um, practices and norms uh, was uh, cultural competence. So it was uh, highlighted, uh, you know, by, by many PIs that it's important for, for um, academics from, from Western academics to understand the cultural context very well, uh, to know how their positionalities, how their own identities are going to be received in the local context. And the other important insight here is that the majority tended to work in Anglophone uh, context or maybe Francophone contexts. Uh, uh, and so language uh, wasn't that, much, that big of an issue for, for the majority of cases, uh, but there were some countries such as Ethiopia where you know, uh, speaking local languages was absolutely key. Um, overall, cultural competence was, was a, a really important Important item that was mentioned throughout. Um, and finally, a final set of insights related to the funders, uh, specifically to UK Rice, as we'll talk about GCRF. Um, it was um, sort of discussed quite a, quite a bit that um, LMI, that the, the UKRI needs to engage more with LMIC partners and explain to them, you know, the application process, especially how to determine eligibility, because that could, can be quite complex and the terminology is very specific to the UK context. Uh, again, as it emerged in the series throughout, you know, the tight deadline seemed to be quite problematic because it really deterred academics from or hindered academics to engage authoritatively with their partners and explain the details of the project, not just the budget and the costs and what uh, each one was expected to do, but also, you know, the methodology behind the project and the, and the objectives and so forth. So um, the, car, the current uh, funder uh, guidelines make it very difficult to engage in that process collaboratively. And the, the a very important uh, uh, other observation that was made, which I'd like to mention, is that some PIs felt that certain schemes, especially the year Simono beneficiary grants, uh, because they place emphasis on the intellectual exclusivity of the PI, you know, the project being the intellectual product of the PI's experience, uh, they felt that this deterred actually PIs from getting into partnerships because the application wouldn't be perceived as competitive. Uh, so this is something that funders could keep in mind. And I'd like to stand on the concept of equitable partnerships, uh, which I actually explored with PIs and I asked them how they understand it, if they thought that is realistic, and if they had any other alternative approaches to building collaborative partnerships. Um, some of them related to the concept and said, you know, they understand equitable as designing, implementing and disseminating the research project. Um, but there were also critiques, you know, essentially many people said, look, the budget is controlled by the UK based PI. So, you know, it's uh, ab initio asymmetric. And some thought that the PI can more easily walk from a partnership. So obviously that's a, a power imbalance. Although others observed that in some cases, the PI relies quite substantively on the local partners. So that creates a reverse dependency sort of a situation. Uh, and finally, there was a comment that the language can be misused. Uh, while the, the idea of equitable partnerships helps to overcome this attitude that Northern researchers know best, it can also be deployed to suggest that, you know, invariably knowledge always sits with the global south. So I really liked one PI in film and screen studies who spoke about creative or dialectical partnerships, which they understood as a project that is developed on the basis of their own research and experience and expression of personal creativity, but simultaneously a creative process to bring partners, collaborators and participants in to achieve reciprocity and mutual learning. And I'd like to finish with, you know, some key insights for, for or I guess, suggestions or highlights for the three stakeholder groups. I think the, the main message in terms of uh, the, the for academics and PIs is to really set out the expectations of the project with their partners in great detail and make sure that those details are inclu included in contracts. Um, and to understand the strength and, and appreciate the strengths and resourcefulness of partners to make sure that, you know, the team, the whole team can develop uh, their skills with through that pro process. Um, and I think it emerged, it, it was act actually a PI did mention that, um, you know, being an, an interlocutor uh, among equals is actually the best approach one can take. In terms of professional services, it, it's important to recognize again that, uh, you know, partners, more reciprocal and equitable partnerships can be developed if partners are enabled to start their activities timely. So if payments and contracts are in place and also to uh, understand that, you know, different organizations have different modes of operandi and conditions and context. So it's really important for offices to try and adapt to these as feasible 
And finally, for the funders, again, for UKRI to really work with LMIC partners in terms of the application process. Uh, and a really important observation that was made by API that you know, funding bodies need to realize that working to build strong partnerships takes a lot of energy and effort outside of work hours. And there are trade-offs, you know, maybe uh, that time could be used for publications, for instance. So it's really important for funders to recognize those trade-offs and somehow reward that good behavior of partnerships building. And finally, uh, to really appreciate and trust PIs because over monitoring makes uh, one feel that they're not being trusted. And, and so, uh, you know, PIs are discouraged and they also feel that there isn't a clear mechanism to feedback to the funder what works and what doesn't in, in this monitoring process. And I'll end here and pass the word to my colleague Maru to add her own reflections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Romina. Um, I don't want to take uh, any, any additional time from, from our speakers, so my reflections are going to be really brief. Um, the series was uh, a, the product of conversations that we had uh, internally at Oxford, but also uh, with our, our colleagues at SOAS. Um, Oxford has a significant uh, portfolio of research, uh, ODA funded research, and, uh, and we felt it was important that given this growing portfolio that the, the emphasis of ethical research was, uh, was made and the, the ethics was at the forefront of, of, um, of all we do. Um, and it became very clear right from the beginning that ethics is more than just you know, being nice to participants and avoiding harm and, uh, and, and bringing some, some good. But, but to do ethical research uh, in, in, in this, in this field required us to engage with important questions of power and hierarchies and equity. And, uh, and therefore we organized a, 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 an event in, in July last year to kind of begin to tease out some of these issues. And, uh, and, and from this and a similar event that um, happened at SOAS in, in September, uh, we decided to kind of continue the conversation by, by exploring more in depth these, these, these issues. Um, we what have learned personally, uh, I think one of the lessons, one of the, the key messages that I take from the series is there is a lot of good practice already. Um, there is a lot of awareness in our research community and also in our research offices of the enduring inequalities um, that kind of impinge on, on research partnerships. Um, at the same time, I think uh, that there's a recognition that we need to, um, we need not to shy away from these inequalities, but acknowledge them and work within and despite them. And, uh, and the other key message that I take from the series is that, um, change requires not only change uh, in, 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 in our approach and how we researchers or research officers uh, relate to our, our counterparts in, in, in developing countries, but it requires systemic change. Uh, it requires challenging some of these structures um, that can kind of prevent truly equitable uh, collaborations and that also prevent research from achieving that social value that is very much at the heart of uh, programs like GCRF. Um, we hope that this is not the end of the conversation. We hope that we're, we're closing, we're bringing the series to a close, but that somehow we can continue the conversation. And perhaps one of the, the, the things that we can discuss at the end is, you know, what people feel that they would like to see moving, moving forward. With that, I, I will hand back to Alex. Thank you very much, Maru and Romina, for those very insightful kind of remarks and, and thoughts there. Um, I won't dwell on dwell and reflect on them right at this moment because I'm keen, as you say, to hear from our speakers. So um, I shall just hand over now to Emma to, for you to present. Thank you so much, Alex. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and thank you so much for asking me to talk about partnership. Um, I should say that I'm an anthropologist um, because I think that helps explain some of the way that I think. 
and uh, I specialise in the study and uh, the practice of working within organisations, particularly parliaments and civil society organisations. And I've been thinking about this topic of partnership since the late 1980s, when I was working in international development NGOs. And I, I've always thought of it as a bit of a teddy bear word, because it's kind of cuddly and reassuring sounding, unless it actually genuinely comes alive. And like a bear, it then gets quite scary. And the reason for that is I think if you're really serious about partnerships, it's, it's extremely hard work and often very, very challenging. So if you're really open to difference and really open to other people's challenges and interests and opinions, uh, then it, it makes life much more interesting, but it's also, it's also challenging. So my, my outline is um, that I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the project that I'm working on at, at the moment. Um, say something about our approach to partnership, something about how we evaluated it and hopefully uh, have time to get to some, some practical suggestions about how to work towards being better partners in a world where it feels like you've got a lot of constraints. Um, so basically the, the Global Research Network on Parliaments for People is a bunch of organisations across the world coordinated by a team in SOAS uh, and we all share an aspiration which is to create opportunities for scholars in the global south to do their own research. So what's unusual about this is it's grant making. So it means that all our PIs are um, scholars who design their own uh, projects. We don't design them, we don't contract people. They come up with their own ideas. And what's interesting is that we had a competitive process, very tough peer reviewed competitive process. And we gave 42 grants and the people who were eligible were in Myanmar, Ethiopia and the UK. And the UK only won two competitively. And both of those PIs were actually diaspora. So it was interesting. And we also were very committed to making sure that the grants got to people outside the capitals, outside the dominant ethnic groups, weren't all women, weren't all people of a certain age like myself. Um, and uh, that was hard work. We went up and down the country. When I say we, that wasn't so us, that was our partners, which were critically, they were the, M the Enlightened Myanmar Research Foundation in Myanmar, Forum for Social Studies and Setuit in Ethiopia. So it was mainly their job, but we also supported. We ran workshops, we had a technical inquiry service, we did mentoring, we answered every email that when people asked us questions, because we, we understood that it wasn't very common for scholars in these um, regions to have their own opportunity to do their own research. And therefore, we shouldn't just assume that it's really obvious uh, how, to, how to actually make the applications. So um, I think the first thing to say about how we worked on partnership is that from the very beginning, we thought about legacy. Even more than we thought about impact, we thought, what are we all going to be collectively leaving behind? And it meant that we were continually focused on capacity development for all. And we tried to think very, very hard about how to work in a way that left sustainable benefit. For example, we knew that we only had one window to give these grants. So from a very early stage, we tried to give information and sometimes with Alex's help actually, uh, and training about where to get grants from other sources. Uh, so that our grantees could go elsewhere. We also did various advocacy campaigns. We've got one going at the moment, which we'd love everyone's support for, which is making the argument to the UK Parliament that despite the DFID FCO merger, there should be a separate aid committee. So we're just, um, I'll, 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 I'll give you the details about, about that later, but we'd really, any support for that would be brilliant. So the second thing to say about partnership, as, as Romina explained, is that we, we try and have a very clear idea about who's doing what and what the responsibilities are, but continually review. So really that's the character of our programme, endless discussion, review and adjustment. So our partners were always looking at needs and demands and always coming back to us and we encouraged them to do so, uh, to explain that actually adjustments were needed. So 
there weren't enough women uh, applying for grants in Ethiopia. So um, at that point, we made a whole extra special ring-fenced program for women scholars, just to give an example. Um, so we were um, unsurprised when, you know, two years into this program, we had an explosion of incredible outputs. And so if you look on our website, you can see some of them already. There are books, there are journal articles, there are films, cartoons, animated film, all by our PIs and, and, and their teams in Myanmar and Ethiopia. Uh, we're not very surprised by that, but it's very gratifying to have all this, this research by Global South scholars as evidence of what is possible. Um, but we're also interested in, in learning about how we are as partners. So we did this kind of initiative of, of what we called collaborative ethnography. And um, the result of it is a policy briefing. So it's in draft at the moment. I think it's, uh, the link has been circulated. If anybody would be prepared to read it, it would be brilliant. Uh, because we do see it as a very collaborative exercise. So comments, suggestions, what gaps have we got, what have we got wrong, please send as critical comments as you can, and uh, we'll try and improve it and, and finalise it early next year. Uh, so that's the, the result of our evaluation. How did we do it? Well, like any evaluation, with a very complex mix of kind of improvised methods, uh, it's explained in the policy brief, but the one that I was quite surprised by was the survey monkey we just did, which doesn't normally get very good results, but because they know us, our grantees and our partners put very, very honest comments in, in even in an online survey where people are normally a bit cautious. So, um, and the other thing to mention is that because we're interested in very diverse views and we know that everyone's experience of everything is, is different, even interpreting all this data has been really, fun but also extremely argumentative so our little team in, in SOAS has very very lively arguments about what's happened and, and why and um, our findings uh, of this um, ethnography are partly connected to principles so um, probably the most important one there is about relationships so at the heart of partnerships is always relationships which of course anthropologists obsess about so actually, I think they make better managers um, than you might think. And, and I think when thinking about relationships, part of what you're doing is continually asking, what impact is this likely to have on other people and other organisations? And who is getting left out? Um, we continually had our, our assumptions challenged. We were continually trying to nurture each other's curiosity. And particularly when doing anything political, we never moved without consulting um, our partners. I, I think I'll, because I'm running out of time, I'm gonna come back to the whole argument about whether or not we're contributing to democratizing or decolonizing, but we, we've downgraded our claims, I suppose, as we realize that it's pretty arrogant to make that kind of claim in one program. Um, but I think that'd be f something fun to, to debate later. So just to, to finish off, I've got three areas of sort of more practical recommendations. Um, uh, arising from this ethnography. The first one is about money. And uh, we took trying to make the kind of financial uh, planning and, and management um, as, as flexible as possible and as tailored as possible to every single different grantee and partner. And this was possible because our finance officer, who I, I think is in the audience, so she might be able to answer questions later, um, Bethel Worku, really negotiated and discussed with every single grantee and, and gave them training along the way if they weren't used to financial management. So it meant that we could be flexible. Um, we also have a set of recommendations about uh, knowledge, the heart of which is to challenge the often rather racist assumptions about how knowledge is valued. It's still the case that it's assumed expert, expertise is found more easily in the global north. It's not, it's not our experience. So these hierarchies, as Maru pointed out, need to be continually challenged. And the last area, probably most important of all, is about communication. Where we failed is, we didn't manage to get away from the dominant languages. We worked primarily in English, in Amharic, in Burmese. But where I think we did develop considerable skill is in improvising communication so that 
Sometimes we were very formal, but sometimes we were able to be very informal. And we tried to respond to the way that other people wanted to, to communicate. So at all points, our focus was on review, learning and capacity development for everybody, including ourselves. So I'll finish there, but just to say, it would be fantastic if you look at our website, we've just upgraded it. It's got uh, this extraordinary amount of outstanding research by our partners on it. If you do have any comments on the policy brief, please do email us. And our Twitter is showcasing our partners' research just in the last few weeks. Um, so please do retweet our partners' research, but also um, it'd be fantastic if you help with our campaign to keep an aid committee. So thank you very much, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Emma, and thank you very much for keeping so nicely to time as well. Um, so in order to keep us on track, I shall um, hand straight over to um, Emily, who's going to talk to us now. Thank you very much. Um, so my post really came as due diligence manager in response to the change in the funding landscape and the fact that we had to now comply to a new set of terms and conditions and how we do this through GCRF and ODA funding. So my role is really takes a pragmatic approach to compliance, um, which is based on the University of Oxford's risk appetite. And through this, I support colleagues within Oxford, our international collaborators, and we go through a whole process from cradle to grave. So I, I enjoy the fact that I'm now able to support people right from application to post award. And one of the, the, the need for ODA compliance, we've seen it straight to application stage where we kick off our due diligence. And throughout this whole process, there has been so many challenges. Um, but this has helped us to shape and develop our due diligence process. And I think from the very start, we realized that we have to ensure we don't create a massive lengthy process that's gonna then stop projects um, from signing contracts. And we didn't want to have a tick box exercise because that's not gonna help develop us or our, our partnerships. So we decided to devise a short questionnaire, but given that we were, it was quite broad and sent out to so many different international collaborators, we've kept it in, in a way that we ask for a lot of evidence. When then we assess the evidence, again, based on our own risk appetite, and then we sort of tell people if they're medium, high or low risk. Um, and I think that one of the biggest barriers that we came across straight away which is obviously the terminology that's flowed down from the funders, very imperialistic and almost embarrassing to ask some of our collaborators um, certain things. But the way in which we've worked around this is whenever we send out our questionnaires, we always give a hyperlink to our policies so they can read through them and understand a little bit more about the language. We also offer a translation service um, and we bear the cost for that and that comes out of our QR funding and that's worked really well so it speeds things up so we get the documents we translate them into English and all then the legalities are ticked as well so that's that's worked really really well and I think another big challenge um, which has turned into a success story is when we're assessing the financial viabilities of our partners um, we found that many organizations are heavily reliant on government funding that don't cover the costs of their operations across the organization. And to, to get over that one, we asked our partners, um, could you open a separate bank account, deposit the project funding from into that bank account, and then share the transactions as, as and when you go through the project? And I was really nervous at first to ask our partners to do that, to see what kind of response we would get. But it was overwhelmingly supportive. And they, I actually received an email from one of the um, international PIs saying, thank you for doing this. This is the first time we've ever been able to spend the full amount of funding that's come from overseas to our project. And we've been able to do everything that we needed to do without worrying about running out of money. So that was a really huge success. Um, I think another issue that we come across a lot with due diligence is, which I'm sure everybody's aware of, is the buzzword safeguarding, whistleblowing, and, you know, again, even the terminology in different cultures, it, you know, is, is, is difficult to get over. So what we're doing here in Oxford, and I know we've done with Young Lives, is we made an overarching policy for that project and, and worked with each partner to shape that, that policy. So the terminology was kind of 
settled at the beginning, everybody understood what was meant by the policy, everyone signed up to it, and that was then flowed down to everybody that participated in the project. So we are then ticking the boxes for the funder compliance, and we're actually helping our partners to develop areas that what they lacked in, and it's really helped. I know that we've had loads of positive response from partners saying, we, we, we didn't know what whistleblowing meant, but we do understand now, and we do see that it is really, really important, and it's helped them to develop project um, policies for their own organisations. Um, I think, obviously, the other big success story from um, being in my post is not only supporting international collaborators and colleagues within Oxford, but also colleagues across the sector. And as you mentioned, um, I'm part of the ODA community of practice, which literally came about by Joe Green and I from the University of Nottingham, sitting next to each other at a conference and saying, oh gosh, are you having these problems? And despite the, the difference in our organizations, we had exactly the same issues. Then we went for coffee and we started talking to other people and they had all the same issues. So we thought, it wouldn't this be a good idea for all of us to get together in one space and actually talk about how we're going to navigate through these hurdles and problems that are being imposed on us with the funders. Of course, we're trying to feed back to funders all the time, but I think our efforts are best focused in actually developing a, a way around this or with our, with, in collaboration with our partners. And again, also with the REMPRO, which I'm a part of, hopefully that is now going to feed into the ODA community, community of practice and and hopefully going forward we're having a more of a a broader sense of what we're doing but also across the sector we're starting to help each other to get through these issues and i think yeah and hopefully the older cop will i mean despite the lockdown and um, delays and things we're starting things up again and if anybody's interested in joining you can drop me an email or my colleague Joanna Green from the University of Nottingham. Excellent. Thank you very much, Emily. That was really, uh, really interesting to hear the developments at Oxford University. Um, and again, thank you very much for keeping so nicely to time. So I know, I was <laughs> super conscious. <laughs> Brilliant. So um, I, I will now hand over to uh, Jo. Let's hear for your presentation, please. And thank you very much, Alex. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about young lives first, and then I'll explore some of the issues we faced in relation to partnerships. I think Young Lives is very unusual because it moved to Oxford in 2005 um, following a very difficult um, midterm review. And in actual fact, the midterm review had found the partners to be excelling and to be very strong. And the, the sort of mother institution was where the problems lay with the study. So we, it's kind of reverse of, of you know, what one often thinks about in terms of partnership difficulties and challenges and so on. Um, and so we inherited pre-existing partners and they've actually been in the study now for nearly 20 years. So we're talking about people growing up and growing old together. I mean, this is talking about relationships. Um, I think I really would want to emphasize very much um, Emma's point about relationships. They're fundamental. Um, it's probably worth saying that um, Young Lives is present in, in India, um, Ethiopia, Vietnam, and Peru. And those countries were actually selected in part because it was going to be a longitudinal study and there was a need for strong institutional capacity in those countries. I think that that was an important factor at the very beginning of the study. So there were already institutions locally who had the ability to, to manage a, a very long, long term, and, and complex study. Um, I think the situation would be very, very different now um, if you were starting a long-term project at this point in time. You'd have many more countries where the capacity was strong enough. Um, it's a very complex project and I want to stress that everybody comes to it with a different set of role, different roles and responsibilities. And I think the most central thing is it's really important to value their different roles and responsibilities. Without the roles and responsibilities of the individual partners, the study would collapse. It's, there's no two ways about it. So for example, um, policy engagement is a very strong feature of the study, as is um, the tracking and uh, data gathering processes involved in the study. We've had 
um, five rounds of surveys and rounds also of school-based research and also qualitative research. So the ability to track, uh, in effect, 12,000 children and their families across 20 years is no mean feat. Um, so that's another contribution that's absolutely central. The quality of the data is very much a reflection of the very low levels of attrition in the study. Again, that's a contribution directly from the partners. It's about the relationship, the trust that they build with the, with the children and the families in the study. Um, and I think that's absolutely central to, to the way we work. I think that um, it's very important at the same time, as others have already said, to recognize the varying capacities of partners. So they may be very strong in some areas, but not so strong in others. And therefore capacity building from the very outset is a crucial element, but it's not about the budget holding institution building the capacity of, of the country partners. It's about capacity building across all the different um, institutions of the study. So we have leadership in the global south. In Peru, for example, we have leadership on a lot of the research substance. Um, and that is, so it's capacity building in all directions. And that's a fundamental principle of the study. Um, hopefully, making for a slightly less hierarchical uh, and, and centralized structure to the whole thing. Um, I think the other point which has already been made, which is very important for us, is that when you're in a study like ours, you're not able to engage with people full time. It would be too expensive. So we're buying into um, parts of people's time. And that has enormous implications. They're often working to incredible pressures within their institutions that we may not actually be aware of. But also, more importantly, sometimes they are working within institutional cultures which may be very different from ours. So one of the examples I would cite here is in some of our partner institutions, there's an enormous hierarchy between the PI um, at the top and say the data manager or the data gatherer, the enumerator and so on at the bottom. That's not an institutional culture that we would want to um, pursue or to encourage, but it's just the way of things. And we are only a little bit of um, their total portfolio of research and we can't always change things in the ways that we would want them to be changed. And recognizing those institutional differences and the limitations involved, I think is, a, is very important. Um, in coming out of the, uh, discru you know, the description of the study, I think some of the really key points, I think power is inherent in the, the relationships that we all have, even after 20 years, um, I think it's, it's inherent. I don't think we can get away from it, but we can certainly work with it in, in as, as, as best we possibly can to ameliorate some of the difficulties. I see powers residing in the funding, the fund, where the funding comes from, in the data, because data access is absolutely vital, um, and who controls the data and who uses the data and for what purposes has to be defined from the outset, and who gets to publish. So we. We, we invest a great deal in uh, research capacity development, not just in institutional and program development, which, is, which are also very, very important for us, but actually the development of research, which means you know, a lot of um, uh, co-authoring, um, uh, write workshops, writing workshops, and encouraging people to publish as much as possible internationally. I think that's really important. We've had most recently to revisit the issue of data access, data control, and data use. This is very important because it's, it's about the ethical commitment that the study has to the confidentiality and anonymity of the uh, respondents in our research. We can't risk any breaches of any sort. Sharing of personal data is really fundamental. And therefore, we've had to in integrate um, these kinds of norms and values in the study, which can seem to be rather difficult from the point of view of partners who really feel they've gathered the data, it's theirs for the use of and so on. But we, we need to be able to protect the anonymity and confidentiality of our, of our respondents. Um, we do a lot of uh, support in terms of other aspects of capacity development, encouraging people to do doctorates, encouraging people in their training and, and so on. Unfortunately, our donor doesn't include um, that the we're not able to offer partners the right, the ability to 
study through us, through doctorates and so on, which I think is a great shame. And I've often tried to push back on that because for me, that's a fairly fundamental issue. And I think one of the other um, issues for us, which is, is important, has already been mentioned, is communication, the use of language. Yes, we've struggled a lot with which languages to use. We, we're dealing in, uh, the study itself is in 11 languages, but um, our partners don't always have the, the um, complete grasp of English. Um, that is the language, the lingua franca of the, of the study. And we've tried to break down barriers to do with language, including, for example, by developing an intranet for the study. It's been completely hopeless. It's not been used by anybody, including myself. We've tried so many which ways to create stu structures and, me and mechanisms to in 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 include people and also to increase communications between uh, different groups in the study. And they don't always work, however, however hard you try including people in the governance of the study. So we, um, one of the most important things we did was setting up um, the position of country directors. And they are directly involved in the management of the research, but they also have managerial and coordination roles in relation to the many country partners um, that, they, that they're working with. They're also, by the way, very important in the policy engagement work that we do. So as much as possible, governance, um, sharing is, I think, a really important point. And then just finally, um, just to touch on the donor requirements. Our main donor is, is DFID. Um, they pile on more and more and more requirements, um, of which safeguarding is, is perhaps one of the most recent. Um, we work to log frames. Um, we, we, we've used all the different tools of management and so on over the years. Actually, I have found a lot of this to be quite helpful because at least we all know what we're working to. We know we have deliverables. We all have deliverables. It's not just about the partners having deliverables. Oxford, uh, the Oxford team also has deliverables. And although they can be a bit restrictive at times, it's also quite helpful for everybody to, to use for their own self-monitoring um, as much as, as um, for the monitoring overall um, by everybody. I wish all research had an inception year. I think an inception year is absolutely magic for building those relationships, for developing the, the, structure, the structures in real time and not just ticking the boxes that come from the donor. I do worry about the scrutiny that's involved in safeguarding and some of the other procedures that we've introduced. I think they're incredibly important. And, and I think Emily made the, the vital point that it's also about partners learning the value of safeguarding and other procedures for their own purposes, not just for the research that they're involved in with us. But I do, you know, financial management, safeguarding and so on is about scrutinizing. You can't get away from that. Um, and I do think that that sometimes doesn't rest terribly well with trying to be more collaborative, more inclusive, more egalitarian um, in your approach. And so I think any way that one can find imaginatively to make these sort of scrutinizing roles work to everybody's advantage, I think is a, is a really, crucial crucial issue i'll stop there thank you very much joe that was uh, again a really insightful uh, presentation and uh, i think lots for us to uh, talk about at the end so just to reiterate before i sort of i feel like give my presentation um if people do have any questions that they're thinking of do feel free to start typing them in the chat and we'll bring them into the conversation in the next 10 minutes or so um so, <clears throat> so i'll just uh, quickly try and do uh, my technical bit and share my screen Hopefully you can all see my slides, it's only a few. Um, but um, yeah, what, what I, I sort of want to do really is maybe take a, um, a slightly different look and a bit more of a reflection, as you say. I think one of the messages that's come through from all the speakers is the importance of reflecting and asking questions and actually considering um, you know, what, what's been happening before you maybe move forward. So part of this is to just think a little bit about how far we've sort of come along in the last five years. Um, and also uh, to then think about what the next steps might be and how we can perhaps uh, continue to try to work towards um, sort of um, more equitable partnerships or sort of trying to be better partners and sort of, sort of, sort of phrasing it now. Um, so one of the key questions from this uh, seminar as such was, you know, how has the funding landscape changed over the past five years? And when I think back to um, when I joined SOAS in sort of 2014, 
um, you know, working with international partners on a large scale sort of research projects in the global south was perhaps not hugely common across the sector in the UK. Um, obviously, at SOAS, we've been working with international research partners for, uh, you know, not forever really, but um, often it was more the UK researcher going out and studying in country. There wasn't so much, I don't think, um, you know, normality around sort of international research collaborations as, as we're seeing nowadays. Um, and I think there were obviously funders available um, or funding available to do that work from UN organisations. You know, I think back in two, 2015, the Newton Fund was starting to be launched. Of course, there was DFID and we also had the European Commission that was very heavily involved in international research as well. Um, but they were often sort of fairly opaque um, to be able to understand the schemes or how to actually be aware of the funding announcements, the, the opportunities that they came out. Um, and it was, you know, pretty tricky just to secure the funding, shall we say. Um, so that's what I kind of recall when I was uh, started sort of research development when at the University of Sussex um, before moving to SOAS. And then um, during that time also, there was the research councils started to trial um, uh, providing opportunities for international co-investigators to have actual funding being channeled directly to them. And I remember at this time, I think it was the ESRC that first introduced it, um, there was lots of kind of, you know, uh, discussions and navigating and sort of constraints around who, or how the funding should be managed. And um, I remember in one particular example where, you know, it, it was great that now researchers could go and actually say, I'd love to work with you and actually we can, you know, pro provide a budget for you and you, you can manage that and so on and so forth. But actually one of the sort of unintended consequences uh, that came about through this sort of funding scheme was that we had one, I remember one particular grant where once we'd worked out what the UK budget was, we then worked out what the 30% available could go to our international um, collaborators. Um, but um, uh, that, that, that for their bit of the research project, it was gonna cost more than 30%. So actually we ended up having to bump up the UK budget in order to facilitate the enough funding for the international partners. And actually that wouldn't necessarily be the best use of the fund, funders money, for example, but it was what we had to do in order to fit within the realms of the, uh, the funders requirements. Um, so, it, as I say, these funding constraints that often would come out with, with all good intentions would often lead to these unexpected consequences. So how, how do you sort of begin to manage them? And then I think, you know, as as the benefits of actually working more collaboratively with international partners was seen, um, I think that to some extent led to the Newton Fund and the Global Challenges Research Fund. And of course, we suddenly went from maybe tens of, you know, tens of millions of pounds from Research England's budget going out to international partners to suddenly looking at potentially sort of hundreds of millions of pounds. And I think obviously then you're considering that, as um, Joe just mentioned, the scrutiny that goes around that sort of funding obviously increases exponentially as well. And I recall that there was, um, I think it was uh, earlier on the GCRF days, we went to a talk by uh, UKRI looking about, about due diligence. And they were talking about how they suddenly realized that one of their top 20 recipients of funding was outside of the UK, but actually they had very little understanding of how that money was being spent or being utilized. And hence, to some extent, I think that triggered the whole due diligence process. And um, you know, we've heard of some really positive steps that uh, Emily and Oxford University have been implementing. And I think there are always positives to sort of these scrutinies, but as I said, it has to be done in a collaborative way and I think being clear on why you're doing it in the first place. Um, and I think the sort of, you know, the, the due diligence that kind of erupted, um, process that erupted as a result of that, if not handled in the sort of perhaps the correct way, um, it can instantly put your partners on the back foot. And even if they've got a good working relationship with the researcher, your institution can kind of uh, make a mess of it or kind of you know, um, have damaging um, effects on the actual relationship of the, of the partner right at the very beginning of the project, which is the last thing that you want to do. And I think also with, with the sudden shift in the amount of money flowing through, for example, the research councils with the Global Challenges Research Fund, and not just the research council, I think there's about seven delivery partners that have um, put calls out uh, using this UK aid money. Um, it also comes with a lot more scrutiny for them. So they have to do things in a much sort of tighter um, time frame. So, and they also have to justify the expenditure um, a lot in a lot more detail than they had to before. So this kind of flow of scrutiny is coming right from the very top and is then being felt right, you know, if you like, you know, by the, all the researchers on the ground and the, the people trying to work in research offices or professional services um, uh, at universities. 
And so, um, you know, it's a question of how do we actually balance that between being able to explain why we need the scrutiny, but also kind of enabling the research to be done in a collaborative and, and sort of positive way. And I think <clears throat> um, the time frame issue is also a, a massive thing. I think we've, we all learned very quickly on when the GCRF calls and the big hubs in particular were being announced that the calls, these massive projects were being put together in a matter of months then people were being awarded projects um, with only a very short turnaround from announcement of award to the actual start date of the project. And I think Joe's point about inception as well is, in, is incredibly important because, you know, it, it's really valuable that, and I think if there's one recommendation in terms of practical steps when you're preparing these large international projects, is make sure you build in at least a three month window at the start of the project, which allows for you to get all of the HR uh, recruitment processes resolved, any contractual issues sort of around procurement, um, all resolved in those first three months. And actually don't necessarily expect the research as such to really get underway um, right from day one, because um, as I think all of the speakers have said, things like data management um, or publishing or an open access, Everybody needs to share that information because these are things we all need to do and are, you know, all have incredible benefits for, for doing them. But I think the key thing is to be very transparent about what you're actually um, trying to achieve um, through this and why you're doing it. And so I would say when you're trying to put together these um, international research projects and trying to sort of tie up what the funders require of you, what your institution requires of you, and sort of at the same time trying to ensure that not only the research objectives are, are met, but actually there is capacity building on both sides, I would say, um, that, you know, you, you allow for that, um, you allow yourself to be challenged and you allow yourself to kind of challenge back, but hopefully in a constructive way. Um, so I would say, you know, in terms of what can you do um, in trying to become better partners, the first thing I would say is, is challenge the policies of your institution. Actually read them, <laughs> it's always a good start, um, to actually look at how they could potentially be impeding um, the most efficient and effective way of doing research. You know, there are, there are things um, that I think we have to consider and we have to put ourselves in the position of our, of our partner institutions in the countries that they're working in. Um, you know, consider time zones, we talked about language already, but also climate issues. I'm not just talking about environmental issues in terms of flying from one place to the other, although absolutely we should uh, take that into consideration. But actually, if you've got funding which is, you know, has ODA commitments in part of UK aid with tight timelines for which it has to be spent in, you know, if your project's only a year, 18 months long, and you can only get to the region that you need to do research for for three to six months of that year, if there are delays on an institutional perspective of getting payment to your partner, um, then it can, you can lose that window of opportunity and it puts a complete kind of kibosh on the, on the research project right from the very beginning. So I think we also, and certainly as research administrators, have a responsibility to try to articulate that to our other colleagues and other directorates that perhaps don't deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Because generally I think research transactions are kind of a bit outside of the normal um, practices of universities, if you like, when most things are dealt with students, for example. So I think raising awareness of this is really is a really important thing, um, and also to you know be aware at the very beginning. You know, are there any kind of restrictions that are going to happen um, with, because of the country that with which you're working in? You know, do people need licenses to undertake research? Do they need um, uh, you know special permission to you know to receive UK aid funding, for example? Um, and there, there are countless other examples of this as uh, issues of these that can really. Uh, limit uh, working effectively um, with international partners and actually always question well what are the real risks of my institution um, when I'm, I'm, I'm ask, asking all these questions because you know I was asked by one of my colleagues you know well we never we never say we're not going to work with somebody we never we, we haven't done today so what's the point of all of this due diligence for example and I think it's not about you know whether or not we're going to work with somebody it's about identifying I think where everybody stands you know on the playing field and actually how we then mitigate for any risks that might arise in order to make sure that there are no unexpected sort of consequences, if you like, um, that come out of nowhere. And I think the other, the key thing is also um, to think about actually what does the project management look like, um, at, you know, in the proposal? Um, you know, is, it, is, it, is there clear and equitable sort of governance over the project? You know, what is the makeup of advisory boards? You know, the communication, again, that was sort of talked about in terms of having an intranet, but nobody using it. What tools will actually work in, in, in terms of communication? Um, and, you know, what will the success look like? So the, these ideas of legacies um, that Emma mentioned as well. 
um, I think are all really crucial and, and important things that we can, I guess, in research offices, uh, ask those questions. And I think if we can do that and, and sort of un undertake research development through that lens, then hopefully as institutions ourselves, we can start to um, be better partners. Um, so I think, I think that is my time up now as such. So I'm going to uh, stop there. And oh, we have got some things in the in the chat. So um, thank you very much. I'd just like to once again take this opportunity though to thank um, my fellow sort of panel members, if you like, for all of their input. And I think there's lots of common themes that we've seen uh, through these conversations. And I'd like to now um, maybe consider um, what, bearing in mind the fact that with all of this influx of research funding into international research now. And I think the improvements that have been made and the positive steps that have been made in terms of um, building capacity, um, both within the UK institutions and in the sort of global south, what more we can do to continue this? Because we're certainly not there. <laughs> so what more can we do now um, if we're thinking about the next year's sort of planning, if you like, um, to try to be better uh, research partners? Um, so let me just brief. I don't know if anybody from the panel would like to um, maybe pick up on any of the other the other points just whilst I quickly read through the chat or if anyone or from me I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the chat but let me see so yes I went through I, I there aren't any questions to my knowledge um, one question which I oh yes by some, yeah, yeah. By some. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sam Marto um, says, I would be interested in hearing any stories on how we can move from a new colonial stance of the UK partner capacity building, LMIC partners, to mutual capacity building and truly equitable partnerships. So this relates to our, uh, well, what we hope to have a capacity building session and discuss, but maybe someone has thoughts on that. I can I can briefly come up on come, come on this because it's um it's a topic that's been it's been a topic of my research for the last four years but I've been thinking hard about this issue of capacity building and and, and the colonial um, kind of flavor of capacity building. I think the first thing we need to do is change the language and stop calling it capacity building because capacity building implies that we're we're building something because something is lacking. So the first step is to recognize that capacity exists um, and that capacity exists and it might exist in a different form to what we consider capacity. And that brings me to, um, to the question of what we, what we understand by research excellence. Um, I think a lot of the capacity building that I, I see is aimed at you know, empowering or equipping researchers in the global south to produce good research, but to produce good research according to what we in the north think is good research. So to, to, to publish in international journals, to uh, publish in English, to, uh, you know, be successful at uh, capturing grants, etc., etc. And I think uh, one of the first things that need to happen, and need to happen at different levels, but uh, above all it needs to happen at the systemic level, at the level of institutions, is to challenge this conception of excellence and recognize that excellence can take different forms. So one of the things that I, I, I have discussed with colleagues in Oxford is this idea that uh, the, 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 the research career involves uh, publishing in uh, top international journals. If the purpose of uh, research is to produce knowledge, and if, if that knowledge is a knowledge that needs to advance human development, the SDGs or whatever you like, then uh, you need to also think what is the best, um, the best way to disseminate that knowledge. It might be that that knowledge is, uh, serves a better purpose by being published as a policy brief, by being published as a blog, and not by being published in a peer-reviewed journal uh, that is behind a paywall, for example. So it's perhaps challenging all those uh, conceptions of what we understand capacity to mean and, and recognize that capacity doesn't mean uh, being able to, to be a top researcher according to modern standards. Um, I don't know if uh, anybody yeah. has other, other thoughts, but. I, th I think I think you you've hit on a, a few really key points actually, and particularly around sort of challenging the conception of what research excellence is. 
And I think actually there is an opportunity here at the moment with, as we come to the end of this REF cycle, I think there is an opportunity to actually challenge and change the way in which we um, monitor research excellence. And I think you're absolutely right around the publishing aspect. You know, one of the things that came up way back when we did the, uh, the sort of first event, um, the first event at SOAS, for example, not, and we did one in July beforehand, but um, was, you know, was this idea of actually this, this pressure of uh, academics to publish and the time constraints and actually, you know, how are we measuring research excellence? I think it's a really um, important thing because it is one of these sort of perverse drivers um, which might mean that you do certain things just because it will get you that tick box exercise and you think it will help support your institution further down the line. Um, so I, yeah, I'd be interested to hear maybe views on research excellence might look like. Romina? Yes, I just a very quick thought to what Mara said to, to add to that. I, I think it's important to question the, the definition of capacity because I think we tend to think of structures or policies or processes, um, mostly in relation to organizations. But if you, if we redefine. Oh. Oops. I think Romina, unfortunately you've frozen. Emma, your hand raised there. Yes, uh, shall I fill in just while she's coming back? <laughs> yes, I just wanted to very much agree with um, Maru about building is a bit um, misleading. I think a lot of development work forgets how much is already going on. Um, but I do think capacity is still an interesting um, aspiration. I think it's more a question of, of developing capacity, knowledge, skills, experiences, and we're all in that. So it's, as I absolutely agree, we institutions, I mean, we've really struggled in SOAS with things like timely financial payments, for example. So we had to do a huge amount of capacity development. But I, I and I do agree about uh, the learning. I also think um, accountability has to go in all directions. So I think um, the funders should make us more accountable to our partners, for example. Um, but I also wanted to go back to what Joe was saying about power, because if we're challenging kind of neo-colonial processes, we need to understand who's in control of what. And we are inevitably going to be in control of the money to some extent. So you can't make things equitable, as Joe was saying, if you're giving away money. I think it's much more honest uh, and much easier to have a kind of honest negotiation with people if, if you make, you're very clear that there is that power imbalance about money. On the other hand, you can give away control of things like data, intellectual property rights, etc. So, you know, I, I have made it a kind of principle um, that I would never use somebody else's data and publish it. I will only put my name on academic outputs if colleagues, you know, really, really try and persuade me to put it on. So my default position is that people are authors of their own data, they publish their own their own work, and you really have to make a contribution to something if you didn't put your name on it. Can I just pick up? I I I, I just want to pick up a little bit on what you've been saying. I think I think the point is not so much this kind of colonial model about um, the north and the south, but it is about the budget holding institution as opposed to the partners. And I am seeing more and more research which is now being managed from the global south. I don't think we should assume, I mean, we're talking from the perspective, actually rather UK perspective, both about research excellence and also power relations, because in the UK, basically the incentives for academics are all about peer review um, articles. So the problem is within UK institu academic institutional environment, it's not a generic problem of research, I don't think. It's just that that's the requirement on academics in the UK and I am seeing more and more research which is being led from the south. The same problems will apply if you're the budget holding institution, if you're in charge of, say, of implementing safeguarding and ethical policies and so on, you will have power over your partners but you can be based in Kenya or Peru or wherever and that is a growing trend. I think it's about challenging some of the assumptions actually made by the donors who seem to they make the assumption that research should be led, managed um, from the global north. I wouldn't share that assumption at all. And certainly in Young Lives, um, where we've got very strong partners in, in some cases, they're doing their own fundraising. They're, they're fundraising for Young Lives to do 
research on our data that they are leading on, they are getting the money for it. So we have a much more complicated arrangement now where the central fund may be from DFID to Oxford, but actually there's a lot of bilateral funding going on as well, directly from local um, organizations to local partner institutions. I think that's the future. And I think that that should be encouraged and we all need to contribute to, you know, making it happen actually. And it's as much as anything, it's about challenging the assumptions of donors about where excellence resides and what excellence is and who ought to be taking responsibility for research. Yeah, I think that's a really actually really important that, you know, we should, I think, encourage more research funding flowing to the uh, Global South partners directly. And as you say, then, then leverages further funding, maybe more locally as such as well. Um, but I, I was just thinking, though, in terms of I think there, I think this is again where these sort of unintended consequences come in because on one hand you've got that sort of international research development and sustainable development goals and the flow of funding wanting to go out to the global south. But on the other hand you have UK universities having to kind of secure as much research income as possible and be measured against how their research income comes in. So I think there also needs to be um, you know, a, a change in the metrics by which universities are measured as well. You know, it shouldn't just be about the total amount of income that you receive. It should be about actually how much flow through funding is going through your organization or, you know, there should be other metrics as well. Perhaps I think I don't exactly know which ones, but, you know, and especially if, if funding is going to be bypassing UK HEIs entirely, then maybe it's a question of how much sort of research income you're getting as an international co-investigator in these projects as well because it would hopefully set you up as a you know demonstrate your research environment for example um i just remain i'm conscious that you lost um internet for a moment so do you oh, oh it's okay you. can you hear me now yes <laughs> Um, yes, I think I was trying to say that, you know, we, we, also, we, we really need to take a step back and think of capacity in, a broader, ter in broader terms. Um, I, I'm working on a project currently and, and, you know, in our context, we're really trying to structure and design the project in a way that knowledge flows from the Global South partners, uh, in this case, Ethiopia and Eritrea, to the UK. And actually, the knowledge and experience we collect and gather and, and uh, you know, uh, become exposed to in these contexts can actually help us address challenges in the UK. So the structure and the concept itself is such that allows us to think differently around capacity. So I think it's really becoming a bit radical in, in how we conceptualize it from the very beginning. Uh, 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 yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree as well. So, I think, I think thinking about um, capacity and research excellence, and you know, then maybe because part of us said um, this seminar is also to think about the next steps for the future. I think the other thing we maybe the elephant in the room, if you like, is obviously the current climate that we're living in. Obviously, there is the pandemic. That's that's one thing. Um, but as Emma alluded to earlier as well, with the merging of DFID and FCO and the potential removal, I think of the international. Um, Development Select Committee, um, you know, that scrutiny over ODA funding as well, you know, what is going to be the potential implications for us? There is yet to be any uh, sort of formal announcement of the next tranche of GCRF funding. Um, so with all of that in mind, I'd be interested to hear, you know, not only from obviously the speakers, but if anyone in the audience that's listening to, I guess, their considerations of this at the moment, and also just to chuck it in there as well, the, the the discussions around research culture. There's been a huge amount of press recently around the research culture of universities um, and this bonfire of bureaucracy as well. And I think, so as I said, I think there is an opportunity now to actually put forward some alternative ways of doing things. Um, so yeah, anyone got any thoughts on that really? Silence. <laughs> um, there is a question for Krishna. I don't know if you want to um, I would be, seen. Where is it, would be, uh, it would be interesting to share experience on A, the challenges posed by the government bureaucracies in the partner countries, as well as unfriendly, friendly and friendly policy environment as they relate to the international research and funding, and B, ethical issues and dilemmas. For example, UK institutions requirements not fitting well with to realities of partner country institutions. So perhaps we can... Yeah, maybe Joe and Emma, have you got experiences of, of that? Um, I mean, yes, lots. But um, in terms of government bureaucracies, um, I mean, Young Lives is set up to influence government. 
um, that's the whole purpose of the study really is to is to develop more appropriate policies and so on and we're dealing in very diverse country environments where you know government is um, well you know some I mean weirdly sometimes the more centralized um, governments are easier to deal with the ones that are more autocratic in their um, work than the, the more democratic ones because often the democratic ones you just have endless changes in in, in staff, which means you've just built a relationship, you've just started to share your research evidence and somebody moves on. Whereas often in the centralized system, you can really engage with people who um, are really very much more in control. But I think government environments are getting very tough for research. And I noticed the question, the second part of the question is about ethics. One of the things we're, dis we're seeing is that ethics clearance now in many countries is a business. Mm -hmm. People are getting charged more and more and more to get ethical clearance. And you don't really feel as though it's a genuine engagement with your ethical uh, principles at all. It's again, it's ticking boxes and it's charging a lot of money. And it, it seems to be a new stream of government funding in some contexts. It's actually becoming very difficult for researchers. Perhaps some of the most extreme environments is where an ethical, a requirement of doing research in a particular country is that you share your data with government automatically. I won't name countries, but there are a few countries where that's now the case. Frankly, there's just no way you can do that. And so does that mean you don't do research in those countries? Or does it mean that you sign up to something that you have no intention in delivering on? I know some of my doctoral students have faced this. Um, and particularly difficult if your data are actually in, in a way a critical of government and government policy and so on. You have no idea what security risks um, your respondents are going to face if you're forced to share data with them. So I, I think it's actually a really big issue and I see it as growing as a problem. And I see a whole kind of, I don't know whether it's because research is inherently threatening to governments. I think that's part of the problem. It's seen as a, an inherent threat and therefore there's an issue of control and ownership of, of data and of researchers. Yeah, my um, experience is irritatingly resonant with that uh, because I do like an argument, but I am afraid I agree with Joe. The situation that we're in since we study parliaments is that we're very much uh, supporting our partners and our grantees to engage with um, government and with Parliament, particularly, for example, with regard to the restrictions on um, civil society organisations and especially restrictions on them receiving foreign funding. So um, certainly in one country, I think actually our partners have had some influence um, on changing legislation about that. Uh, so uh, while we think it's com absolutely understandable if um, governments uh, want to scrutinise or, or, or demand some accountability for what exactly is going on within those international partnerships. Um, I suppose our partners very much make a strong argument that civil society needs to have the capacity to do research and not only in universities, which comes to the second of Christian's point, which, which is about host organisations and due diligence. Um, so some of my colleagues, I think, find it frustrating that funders tend to, and, and so as tends to require that all money has to go through host organisations. That can be very difficult in situations where you've got extreme conflict, for example, uh, or restrictions on civil society. So I suppose, you know, endlessly exploring some flexibility about some, just having the capacity to, to make exceptions so that sometimes you might need to fund researchers in peculiar ways in order to fund some very important research. But I would actually say that I think due diligence is sometimes a bit thin. So in fact, we went far further than we were required to in terms of due diligence because we didn't believe documents. So the idea that due diligence could just be done by demanding a whole series of documents, which are very easily produced as a, in, a, in a sort of fantastic, fantasy way, um, didn't satisfy us at all. So we had conversations, we always had conversations about finances, you know, whether there was um, uh, proper accountability for who signs what and that kind of thing. You know, so we would talk to people, 
and similarly would talk to people about their approach to ethics. Again, you can have a beautiful looking ethical statement, but it doesn't, it's no guarantee at all that um, we feel people have really, really, really thought hard about doing no harm, about their likely impact on informants and, and that kind of thing. So reducing ethics to consent forms is absolutely not good enough. So actually we did much more due diligence, but it was of a much more discursive nature than a documentary kind. Yeah, I'll shut up now. I'd actually like to bring maybe Emily in on that point about the um, sort of due diligence and the, that tip boxing exercise. And because I, 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 one of the things I was going to ask actually was around how you ask organize or people to set up a separate bank account. Mm -hmm. and just maybe expand a little bit on that as well, because in terms of, I say, the due diligence process, having, you know, the separate bank accounts and what have you, you know, might look a bit obscure, perhaps from, from one side of things. So I'd be interested just to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, so yeah, when we so when we go through, we do ask a series of questions and then ask for supporting evidence. And obviously the main financial viability is done by, look, by looking at their recent audited statements. And um, one particular organisation showed that basically they were in a, quite a big deficit due to the lack of governmental funds to cover main of, most of their salaries. And they actually <clears throat> were really upfront and honest about us and we had a big discussion with them. And we said, you know, obviously they answered the question to say they could receive funds from a foreign source and that they do these monthly checks and everything's kept separately. But they told us actually, um, the person that signed that form wasn't completely truthful because X amount is taken for overheads that is not quite embedded within their financial transactions. So this is why we, we sort of spoke to them and they, we said, is there any way you could have opened a separate bank account, you know, um, within your organization for us to put those funds into it? And, and it was, and they were happy to do that. And it worked really, really well. And, and I just want to highlight as well that our due diligence process doesn't finish at me saying, right, these, put this person is high risk. This is what needs to happen, special measures. We make sure that that compliance goes throughout the whole project. And that it doesn't just stop and we just, you know, receive a policy and say, yeah, we've ticked that box. We make sure that that is embedded in the project management throughout the whole um, and, and the post award. You know, we will um, ask for them, you know, to set up their contracts in a way that will reflect that um, monitoring and evaluation. So using deliverables and payment schedules and asking for evidence along the way. So it is a, it is a process right till the end as well. I, I think that's um, really helpful to understand. I think, I think as you sort of articulated there as well, it's about that communication, isn't it? I think mm -hmm. people feel comfortable to tell you the truth. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> then actually, you know, if you convince them that actually we want to work alongside you in order to, you know, achieve the objectives of the project, um, then invariably we can find ways around it. I know at SOAS we had one organisation that didn't have a bank account that could accept international um, uh, bank transfers so we had to collaborate with an additional well no fortunately it was another partner in the same country and we were able to flow funds there and then internally they transferred the money directly and we again were able to sort of um you know do that through the uh, agreements and, and stuff as well so i think i think you know it highlights that real importance of um having that open and sort of transparent dialogue and not being afraid of um you know uh, the uncomfortable things but i think we'll only get that if we're actually you know um approachable as well so i think as institutions we, we can we can uh, you know do, do as much as possible on that area as well um i do i do think it comes uh, again just to come back to um this point around the in, i guess it's that that balance between the sort of local uk pressures and you know the, then conflicting with actually the research that we want to undertake um and i yeah just in the last sort of few minutes it, sort of thinking about how especially as with we have, as we have Emma and Joe on the panel and their links into government and sort of um, ability to influence policy um, is what what could we do as a community perhaps to um, influence policy makers and to make these changes now because I do I think we have maybe a year window personally after the ref has gone in you know that's like lull point not wanting to put more work on everyone's shoulders but that lull after the ref has gone in there's actually i think an opportunity to reflect on the process again because we're going to be stuck with it for the next six seven years and if we don't make change quickly 
you know, that window of opportunity has gone. And really that has to come from, I guess, Bayes now in terms of from the from the UK perspective. So, you know, with Emma and Joe's expertise in terms of influencing parliaments and policymakers, um, I guess, what could we do as a community? Um, obviously, joining the um, OGA community of practice would be a good start. Um, and um, feeding into your policy briefing, Emma, but anything else that we could do? Emma, go first. Yes, um, I think we should be making the argument that um, particularly if it's ODA money, like the Global Challenge Research Fund, um, and it's about um, research in the Global South, then we should take very seriously, really prioritise investment in research capacity in the countries of concern. Um, and so uh, it, it, there is a tension. We need to recognise the tension between that and things like the REF and, and the pressure that UK institutions are under. So as you say, I think we need to reward the UK universities for being good partners as much as for doing their own research. I think, secondly, I think we need to tell the UK Parliament, uh, particularly um, its committees that are concerned with um, international development and foreign affairs, that they should take more evidence from the Global South. They're actually very keen to do this, but they need our help from UK universities and UK civil society organisations um, to act as brokers. Because why should scholars in the Global South who are busy trying to influence their own governments do that? So I think we need to try and, and, and help that um, happen. And finally, anybody who's um, prepared to uh, join our campaign would be so welcome if they agree with the idea that we need to have a separate aid committee because uh, the merger is partly about shifting money from development to foreign affairs issues like security and that is more difficult if there's a separate strong committee that looks at all government departments and how they they spend on ODA and last night the Prime Minister agreed with this so if we could just encourage him, although it's not the government's decision, it's the parliament's, it's the decision of parliament. So if we could encourage that, uh, I'll put a link in the chat. Um, that would be fantastic. Excellent, thank you. Jo? Uh, very, very briefly, because I would endorse everything that Emma's saying, but I would just like to add that I think we're seeing a slippery slope. Um, I think we're seeing the decline of tertiary education as a sector. I think we're seeing the decline of the value of research evidence in policy making. I think we're seeing more normative um, policies than ever before. So it's all going in the wrong direction right now. Um, and I think we have to work really hard. I personally think we can build in the UK in particular, the fact that, that the UK is punching well above its weight in terms of research evidence around COVID-19. I think to demonstrate the value of research in itself is an exercise that we have to go through because all of the things that Emma says are valid, but if people don't think research evidence matters or they don't need to make their policies on the basis of evidence um, or that the evidence is, is inconvenient and therefore they'll oppose it, then we're in real trouble. And I do think now is a good moment because we've shown just how important universities and research and education centers are um, and also because this pandemic is a global pandemic and we need healthy populations across the globe, we can also make the case for the funding to research and the support for researchers in other countries. I'm not just saying, I'm not trying to say that everything should be focused on, on the pandemic, but just that this is an opportunity that we ought to be building on because the, the direction of travel recently with our current government and not just this government, but in many other parts of the world has been all in the wrong direction. The devaluing of knowledge, um, of evidence and evidence-based policy is a real, real challenge that we face, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I couldn't agree with every, you know, what you and Emma have just said more, to be honest with you. And I think we do need to, I think part of it is that research communication again, but actually more to say locally, not just internationally, but obviously also with the international um, governments as well. And if we had more time, I'd be asking you more about how to influence international governments as well. But before we do wrap up, um, uh, I hope you've all really enjoyed this session. I know I certainly have, but before we do close up, we've got maybe one minute. Do, do Maru, Ramina or Emily have anything else to add, Ramina? 
Um, <laughs> I, I wonder if we want to go around and uh, for everyone to say a word or a last sentence. Mm -hmm. How's it, how might that sure. sound? Go on then, okay. Rubina, you start. Then I would have to start. <laughs> I should have not suggested. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's a, it's a continuous learning experience and we just need to be open to learning. And, and as we emphasized many times before, it's not what we can do, it's praxistically doing what we should be doing. And I think this point was made many times before, continuing being respectful, uh, you know, being open, being transparent, and, and embodying those human values and bringing those into our projects. So uh, I think it's, it's this sort of comprehensive attitudinal change that we need to, to persist with and cultivate. Thank you, Marie. Okay. Uh, I don't have much more to add, but uh, in response to your question, what more can we do? Uh, to bring about change. I think perhaps one thing that uh, we need to perhaps bring together is the, uh, which you mentioned as well, Alex, the, the kind of movement around changing research cultures with together with uh, the, 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 the growing movement of, uh, you know, ODA uh, partnerships, because a lot of the bad behavior <laughs> that I see is uh, due to the wrong incentives. So people are incentivized to play dirty because the institutions place demands upon them that kind of corners them into kind of difficult situations. So, you know, we can't begin to think about equitable partnership until and unless the research culture changes. Uh, I don't want to say that the research culture needs to be completely changed. There are lots of good things about the way uh, we do research in, in the UK. Um, but there are uh, perverse incentives that, uh, that, need to, that need to change. And they need to change, um, unfortunately, they need to change from the top. Uh, reward mechanisms, promotion mechanisms, the, 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 the mm. um, uh, kind of monetary monetization of, of, of academics as, as, you know, grant making machines, uh, all that needs to, needs to change. And we need to recognize that those uh, demands that we place on academics force certain behaviors that then we condemn. Thank you. I'll stop here before I get into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Emily, any final thoughts? Um, I think, yeah, like we've mentioned so many times today, communication is key and I am lucky enough to be able to, to communicate from the very beginning to the end. And I think that sometimes don't worry about asking those difficult questions to your partners because actually they want you to, but they want your support in helping them to change the attitudes of even their own organisations. I think that's what we've really learned recently. Um, that, you know, sometimes the people that fill in the forms or provide me with evidence are, you know, aren't the best people to talk to. Actually, the researchers that are, are carrying out the projects and, and have the experience of being the ones that actually write the policies for the projects really appreciate our support and, and has seen that we're working together to create a policy that benefits both of us. Because actually, Oxford, we don't tick, tick all the boxes for um, DFID, you know, with compliance. So <laughs> I always say that to my part, to the partners, you know, we are non-compliant. So therefore, this is why we think that working together and creating a policy together, we will then tick their boxes. And I think just having that communication and, and trying not to impose, you know, this is what we're telling you to do. I was putting it on the funder, that's always my, like the best way forward. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Emma, do you want any final thoughts? Yes, I, I just want to, to kind of echo the, the collaborative spirit, including of this event, actually, because, you know, in a way, universities are set up in competition against each other, as Myra was saying, just, uh, just as academics are as well. But despite that, you've created something which is really, really collaborative. And uh, you didn't need to do that. And uh, so actually, I find it really, really inspiring and exciting. And um, I do think we all gain. So I so profoundly believe that we all gain if we collaborate and, and we kind of resist the temptation to, to fragment because of the, the competition. But Alex did challenge me the other day. OK, that's fine. But what about the organisations or the people who aren't inclined to be that collaborative? So I think that's the next challenge for me. OK, so how do you try and create?
create the incentives for collaboration, including um, in the funders. So that's the challenge I'm going to be working on. So thank you very much. And Joe? Well, actually, um, I was going to pick up on that same point that we, I don't think we can assume that the re reflexivity that we're all talking about here in this group um, is shared across all research collaborations and research partnerships. And I, I'm still really shocked sometimes by the hierarchies and um, things that I see in some in some research programs that work across the global south. So I do think that it's the onus is on this group, this network um, to actually keep, I mean, I know you're recording the session, but actually to keep disseminating these, I think to break down the barriers, you've got to show that it can be done differently and it can be quite successful when it's done differently. It's not a threat. There is a need for institutional and cultural change in the, in the research environment. And I think just to keep on plugging those arguments and using as many concrete examples of ways in which this has really turned out to be very effective and successful so that people can you know, feel less threatened by this kind of reflexivity and change than they currently seem to be. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think I think absolutely would agree with you. Is my final thoughts that you know it's so much better to work together. I think than to work apart. And I think this whole event series was born out of the realization that we were all going to be doing the same sorts of events. So let's try and join it all up and actually share um, our experiences and not make every single UK university repeat and put in the same amount of um, energy in sort of identifying what the issues are and discussing them. So I think. Um, the, you know, the, the reflexivity and collaboration is, um, has been fantastic throughout this experience for me personally. I've learned a huge amount. And I think also, as, as Emma says, that next thing is to how to manage those, those um, people and organisations that perhaps aren't so willing to engage in this sort of process. How do we affect change in that? And perhaps that's something we can think about in, in the coming year as one thing to move forward. Um, so it just leaves me again to thank everybody. I'm afraid I have run a little over time, um, but I hope it's been worth it. And um, yeah, thank you ever so much, everybody, for your um, input and uh, enthusiasm uh, in this discussion. Um, and thank you, you for sharing. We'll miss you at Suez. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure. Take, Take care. care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.